so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do and how you how you got to where you are today? Yeah, I do lots of things. I am the CEO of the Recover Clinic, which is an outpatient um, service that works with women in central London. Um, but we also have an online um, offering as well. So we treat women internationally as well. Um, I run um, lots of digital programs, which are basically designed to empower women, help them to kind of overcome limiting beliefs, anxiety, um, and I guess essentially really challenging this idea that we all are having to live and manage mental health issues such as anxiety or depression um, and actually trying to help people really overcome them fully for good. Um, and then I coach some people and I'm also an author. Amazing. And you have a book uh, that recently came out, Find Your True Voice. Can you share a bit mm -hmm. about what that is about? Yeah, Find Your True Voice is really about helping people to become empowered to live a life that's based on their own wants and needs and having the confidence to be able to really attune with those and then live by them. So I think my experience was that I very much lived by what other people's expectations were of me, um, that I felt super anxious a lot of the time. And a lot of that was about not really honouring what was important to me. Um, and we've been treating this and helping women to overcome these things for the last 17 years in my clinical practice um, and through my clinic. And it felt like a really nice thing to do to be able to just put that in a book and put it out there so it was accessible to more people. It's amazing. And I've read the book. I absolutely loved it. I'm thinking about several people that I might buy it for or just suggest that they <laughs> read it. It's, yeah, it's going to help so many people. Amazing. Um, can you share a little bit about your own your own kind of experience and the sorts of things that you've that, that have helped you or a bit about your journey to healing you know some of the yeah. things that you've healed I think for me um I didn't necessarily know that what I was experiencing was something that I needed to overcome I kind of just accepted feeling anxious and accepted feeling like persistently low mood um and kind of then just bumbled through sort of reacting to life. It didn't occur to me to fight for what I really wanted. It didn't occur to me that I maybe had needs that weren't being met. I just didn't have that kind of developed emotional dialogue to kind of communicate things. Um, and when I got into my early 20s, I was in a real crisis. My relationship with food was really bad. My self-harm behaviours were really bad. And... I was just shifting from one abusive relationship to the next. Um, and for whatever reason, it didn't really occur to me to do anything differently. I don't think I was conscious enough of the fact that the common denominator in all of these sort of catastrophic scenarios or crises was me. And that actually it was me that was making these decisions and seeking out these relationships and treating myself in this way. Um, and I never thought about why I was doing that either. Um, and it took several years of trying to just survive those things and trying to manage my own anxiety um, with really no clue at all on how to do that um, or that I could challenge that to be any different. Um, and it was probably about 15 years ago, maybe slightly later, um, that I realized that I'd just been unhappy for most of my life. And it was the most sobering thought to realize that you'd just been unhappy. And it just struck me as the most miserable existence. And I know that sounds really obvious, but genuinely, I just thought this can't be life. This can't be the rest of my time on earth, just feeling like this and firefighting constantly. Um, and I had friends and I was able to work and I had a job. I was kind of functioning, but I just was miserable, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided to try and do something about it. I'd had loads of therapy on and off over the years, but really in response to crises. So I was often in a therapy situation talking about an abusive relationship or talking about my inability to look after myself. 
And nobody ever really challenged me to think about the narrative that I was living by. Like, what was the story I told myself about who I was? Um, And I think what I decided to do was to pursue something better. And I didn't know how that was going to play out. I didn't know how I was going to do that. Um, But I decided to change my life. So I committed to ending um, abusive relationships and one particular a really abusive relationship that I was in, I just walked away from. Um, and I decided I wasn't going to do that anymore. And all of those red flags that I had when I met those people and realized they probably weren't going to be very kind to me, I was going to listen to them. And that was kind of my first step. Um, I also became a mum. And I realized that what I was modeling for my daughter was such a low expectation of what life could be like. And so I was really committed to doing something different for her as well. She was a really amazing motivator for me to change things. And it wasn't necessarily all about being a good mother either. It was about showing her that women could have something different, that I could fight for something different. And so that's kind of where it all started really. And then my healing itself was cobbled together through healing other people. I was a clinician and healing other people was a massive um, catalyst to my own healing and nurturing others. Um, Books, meditation, seeking out those voices that I felt there was a real lack of in my own life, kind of wise people who'd maybe walked this journey before um, that I just felt I needed guidance from. And I just sought those people out. Mm, yeah and and I'm I'm wondering well I hear I think from a lot of people that it's kind of a sense of not realizing that there's another way to be or not even realizing it's a problem like they've been anxious for as long as they can remember and so they don't even know that that's not normal to be worried about things or to feel have a low mood a lot of the time and so kind of recognizing that there is another way I think you know as you say is such an important part of it um I know you talk a lot about trauma in the book and that you believe that it's actually trauma that's at the root of a lot of the things like anxiety and depression that we experience. Can you share a bit about that? What what, what do you mean when you say trauma and why is it kind of at the root Mm -hmm. of a lot of our, our issues? I think when I'm talking about trauma, I'm meaning any event that we've found traumatic, difficult to process um, and challenging in our lives and how we then respond to that. So in my case, I didn't have the tools and strategies in place to be able to respond to those difficult events in a nurturing, self-caring way. I internalized a lot of my experiences. My reactions to things weren't validated by the people around me. They were minimized or dismissed altogether. Um, Um, Also, what was modelled for me, I wasn't growing up with people who were nurturing themselves or treating themselves with care and love and compassion. I was seeing people surviving and getting on with things and not really acknowledging when things were difficult or challenging. And so the responses and the coping tools that I developed to try and cope and manage those experiences were destructive and Um, easy to access you know the whole aspect of kind of disordered eating was something that was being thrust upon me culturally anyway this pressure for women to be extremely thin to be totally micromanaging our relationship with food and it was a distraction it was a distraction from the pain that I was feeling internally so when I was thinking about what diet I was on or how much I weighed I wasn't thinking about how much pain I was in I wasn't thinking about some of those really traumatic and difficult experiences that I've been through. And I think what we tend to do with traumatic experiences and challenging life events is we really look to validate them based on what other people's experiences have been. So the first thing that so many people will say was, yes, that was difficult, but so many other people have been through difficult things in life. And they immediately devalidate their experience. And the truth is what hurts, hurts. And it doesn't matter what somebody else has been through. It doesn't change our experience of it. We can certainly feel gratitude for what we have. And we can certainly recognize that we're fortunate not to have experienced some super traumatic events. But it doesn't change the fact that 
that pain is real for us. And that actually, if our response to that pain and those experiences is to acknowledge them, validate them ourselves and begin to nurture more compassionate ways of being toward ourselves, um, we begin to feel better. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't kind of make ourselves wrong, even if we haven't been through like a big trauma, you know, we might yeah. have experienced other things that have stayed with us and can still yeah. have an impact and hurt us or cause us to have these kind of unhelpful behaviours. Yeah, um, I think so. I think a lot of people as well look for trauma in kind of physical evidence of trauma. So being physically hurt in some way or having some external catastrophic thing happen. And people don't recognise the trauma in, say, emotional neglect or being raised in a way where you're never told that you're loved or cared for or having your life choices controlled. Those things are hugely traumatic as well. But because we don't know any different, it doesn't necessarily occur to us to challenge them or question them. So what we're left with is the feeling without really a kind of sense of context about why we might be feeling that way. And is there a way that people can start to find out what what that is? Is there any kind of process that you recommend people do? Because I suppose some people might be thinking, I don't know why I am the way I am, or I don't know why I feel depressed, for example. Yeah, I think that's that's true for, honestly, I'd say 90% of the people that come through the clinic or that I treat, they just don't understand mm -hmm. why they feel the way that they do. And actually, when you begin to kind of get a bit curious and think about what's motivating those feelings people have more answers than they realize they almost don't feel that they have permission to voice them um, and I think one of the reasons I wrote the book is it because it does walk you through those steps to unpacking your truth to recognizing actually what is it that's motivated me to have this very negative internal narrative? Why am I so unkind to myself? Where does that come from? And almost kind of taking a step back and objectively looking at it, like being curious about it and going, actually, I'm, I'm a bit of a puzzle to be solved. Um, and making that your mission, it helps us create a bit of space from the, the emotion of it as well. Um, and then we can begin to action changes and, and begin to shift some of that narrative. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose the the inner critic is such a big part of it. And I know you talk a lot about that in the book. And you talk about something which is the, the unwell voice. Could you mm -hmm. share what, what you mean by that? I think the unwell voice is, for me, any voice that you can call it an internal critic, you could call it uh, like the critical parent. People call it lots of different things. For me, the unwell voice just really summed it up as something I couldn't trust because it was coming from an unwell place. So any voice that was unkind to me or motivated me to behave in a way that was physically damaging to myself was coming from an unwell place. It wasn't coming from a nurtured loving space and so for me the work became about just strengthening even when it felt like I was kind of wading through mud strengthening a more loving narrative toward myself which felt totally impossible and totally false initially but then soon began to feel more organic and more real um, and being so unkind to myself began to feel less and less comfortable so, so it might feel unnatural almost to, to speak to ourselves kindly, or it might feel like we don't quite believe it at first. Mm -hmm. But is it that we should just be continuing to come back to that or strengthening that or repeating kind of kind messages to ourselves? Yeah, 100%. If you think about how often one might speak to oneself in an unkind way, it's constant. It's constant from the minute you wake up to the clothes you put on, to the food that you may eat for breakfast, for how you might show up in a business meeting, for how you might behave around your children. It is absolutely unrelenting that how unkind that voice is and how often it shows up. And so for us to be able to shift to that, we need to make a commitment to speak to ourselves with kindness and compassion. Um, and anything, anytime we step away from something so familiar, even when it feels so wrong, um, it's difficult. It's difficult to begin to exercise a more compassionate relationship with ourselves because it's unfamiliar. But that's why it takes a bit of a commitment. Mm, yeah. 
I wanted to ask you about destructive patterns. And um, <clears throat> there was a few that I was recognizing in myself, self-sabotage, mm-hmm. you know, victim, mm-hmm. victim mentality. Can you give some other examples of kind of these destructive patterns that can show up for us? Oh, yeah, I was like the queen of destructive patterns. So, I mean, I think some of the more like obvious destructive patterns are abuse around alcohol or drugs or sex and food. But some of the like covert ones were the biggest ones for me to shift. So pursuing relationships with people who were unavailable and they would communicate that to me in many, many different ways. And I would pursue them. And then I would feel hurt and rejected and less than and unworthy. And actually, it was me that pursued them. And it was me that knew intuitively that they weren't right. And I did it anyway. And why did I do that? I did it because there was a narrative there that I was invested in. And it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so some of those more covert destructive tools for coping um, were harder for me to identify initially until they were kind of smacking me over the head. They were so obvious, this pattern of going out with abusive people or certainly in my career, like really playing small, feeling like I couldn't speak up or that I didn't have a voice that was worth listening to or that I didn't have anything to say. Again, it was just something that was a little bit more subtle that took me time to identify. But what it meant was that I played small and what that meant was that I didn't progress. And so it came to be that that story I was telling myself that I wasn't good enough became true, that I was being overlooked. Um, But it was me playing the part. It was me playing the role in that story and that script that I'd created. And I think once we become aware of what the story is that we're telling ourselves, we become empowered to do something differently. And that's why becoming sort of fully conscious is so, so key. And it's so, like, it's not very nice to think about those things in ourselves. It's not very nice to look at it sometimes. It can be quite hard to admit, actually, you know, what I'm sabotaging myself or I am, you know, playing small because, you know, those things may play a role in helping us somehow. But Mm -hmm. from what you're saying, it sounds like just being aware of it is going to be so much more empowering for us and then we can actually, actually change it. Yeah, it is really difficult because the unwell voice is there ready to beat you up. When you start Mm. taking responsibility, the unwell voice is like, yep, this is all your fault. And actually it's not about fault and it's not about blame. It's about recognizing that we are unconsciously playing out things that we're not even aware of. And by becoming really awakened to that, it gives us an opportunity to do something differently. I found it absolutely terrifying when I realized how powerful I was in my own life, that actually I was the kind of creator of my existence. Um, And initially recognizing that unwell voice was going to be there when that sort of faded away and I was able to be kind to myself about it. I also got a bit excited because I thought, well, if I've created this, what could I create? What if I actually wanted something different? What if I gave myself permission to manifest something amazing? And that's what I started to do piece by piece, whether it was in my career, whether it was relationships or even something superficial, like where I wanted to live. I just decided Mm. that I was going to create those opportunities because I knew how powerful my unwell voice had been in manifesting a load of things I didn't want. So for me, it was logic that it could work the other way. I just needed a bit of faith. So when you say manifesting, can you share a bit more about that? Is that in a kind of law of attraction type of way or what's your approach to to that? Yeah, I think, you know what, so many people, myself included, have such a block on that, like this idea that you can kind of imagine something and it will suddenly manifest in your life. But actually, if you pick it apart a little bit and you think about some of the examples in your own life as it is today and your belief system, then you can recognize that actually how we think and feel about ourselves does create our realities. Of course it does, because it dictates the people we seek out for relationships. It controls the kind of jobs we go for, the relationships we pursue. And so you think, well, what if I believed I was amazing? And what if I believed I could do anything? And what if I believed there were no limits? 
then suddenly my reality is going to affect that as well, surely. And that will be a reflection of that belief system. Um, and that for me is the law of attraction. It's like no more woo woo than that. Like literally, if I can believe something, then that will become possible for me. And I still have resistance to that, of course, because I find it easier to believe some things than others, but it is a hundred percent my mantra for something. If I don't like something or the way something's playing out in my life, then I know I need to change the way I'm thinking about it first and foremost, and then action will follow rather than the other way around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I Someone asked me on Instagram about manifesting and I basically said, I don't know anything about it. But <laughs> what I said as well was, if you, if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to take the action. If you believe in yourself, you're more likely to take action. So you're more likely to, yeah. to make things happen. Yeah. So it could be as simple as that without needing to think that it's some kind of forces like gravity, the law of attraction. It's so true. It can be as simple as it's that, so really. true. People, people ask me that about the clinic because the clinic is, it's the biggest outpatient clinic in Europe. It's bonkers to me now that that is the case. And someone said to me, well, what gave you the confidence to do that? I'm like, I had no idea that that's what I was doing. I just started a clinic. It didn't occur to me that I couldn't do that. It didn't occur to me. And I think mm. that's the thing. We're always working on the back foot and thinking, how can we overcome these limiting beliefs? How can we shift these obstacles? And it's like, well, actually, they're just a part of our belief system. If we believe anything's possible, then we can do it. And it's honestly, it's a shock to me now. Sometimes I look at my life and think, I can't believe it. But it's just been a kind of fortunate accident in many ways based on me just working on feeling better about myself. Right. Yeah. 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 I suppose, I suppose self-acceptance and self-worth, they're, they're so connected to things like anxiety and depression. So connected. Mm -hmm. Um, are there things, you know, is there anything practical that you could suggest people can do if they want to work on feeling better about themselves and have a better relationship with themselves? I think like primarily just thinking about how you're speaking to yourself day to day is so key. Like just consciously trying to be kind to yourself. I meditate every day and that is an absolute antidote for me to anxiety. It's something that I find super helpful, super calming and grounding. And I don't, I don't know how I would be now if I didn't do that. It feels so integral to, to part part of who I am but I think for a lot of us just making a commitment to demand something better just give yourself permission to say that it's not good enough to feel like that and actually strive for something more than that and I don't know that it occurs to a lot of people to do that people are so busy and just surviving and getting through and today wasn't too bad it's like really shouldn't we be seeking out more joy in our lives um, and that's something I really try and work on connecting to and encourage my clients to how much joy is there in your life? What makes you really happy? How often do you kick your shoes off in the kitchen and have a dance around? You know, how often do you do that and just leave the dishes in the sink for the night? It doesn't matter. Um, and I think for us women, we're particularly guilty of the duty, um, and overlooking the joy so often in our lives. I might have a dance around my kitchen after this. <laughs> Sounds like a good call. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I suppose this is kind of slightly following on from the, the manifesting side of it. Um, you know, connecting to our spiritual selves. You know, often often think when people say to me, you know, I feel like there's something missing in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I often think it's probably spirituality if you don't have anything like that in your life it can really if we don't have that in our lives I think that can be the thing that is very often missing um mm -hmm. what's your kind of take on that and is that something that that you've really done or you encourage your you know people that you work with to do yeah I think it depends on sort of what stage you're at in your own healing journey I think when we are firefighting it's difficult to kind of foster a connection with something greater than ourselves but ultimately, I think that's the key. And I think for anybody that I know who has been on a healing journey and, and found a place of peace, then that's going to be the common thread, that we all have some sort of connection to that in some way. 
I think letting go of what other people's experiences of that are really key because we love to compare and we love a process and we love somebody to tell us what to do. And there's something about spirituality which requires us to let go of the rules and the control and to just be. And I think for me, being in nature, and we've all been in a in a situation where we've been outside and we've been witnessing a sunset or we've been in awe of something, whatever it is in nature, that's helped us to just let go for a minute and be perfectly still and mindful and at peace. And that's spirituality. It's being humbled, being in awe of something greater than you that you can't control, that you don't need to think about, worry about. It just is. And I think having that anchor day to day is something that is so key to staying connected um, and healing. And I think that idea of humility has been really good for me and really good for challenging the ego as well. Just recognizing that I am no greater or less than anybody else, that I am connected to everybody else just through the wonder and torture of what it is to be human. Um, And I think something divine reminds me of that regularly. I love that way of describing it. I think sometimes it can be off-putting if you think that you need to, I don't know, have a religion or you have to believe in God, kind of the the guy with grey hair in the clouds, but actually it can be our connection to nature. It can be that feeling of sacredness that we get when we see something amazing in a child or a sunset or something like that. You know, it Absolutely. Seems we can. We all have had experiences like that, so I love that. I wanted to also ask you about fear, how to tackle fears. I think, you know, fear is a big and continuing part of my life. I'm constantly being met with different fears, and it doesn't matter if I've overcome one fear or if I've grown in one area. There always seems to be like a new level of things that are kind of challenging. Mm. Um, And I was wondering, you know, what's your kind of take on how we can tackle our fears and Mm. um, any kind of words of advice that you have for people around that? Yeah, I got a bit to say about this, to be honest, because it was something that um, I've kind of navigated. I think when people talk about anxiety, they're actually talking about being scared a lot of the time. And I talk about that in the book because... People talk about anxiety as it just is, but what you're describing there of it easily transferring from one thing to another, there's always something to be scared of, isn't there? But I think when unprocessed trauma sits in the body, we have a kind of consistent sense of unease. And then human logic gets us to try and resolve that unease by looking around us, thinking about what might be troubling us and eradicating it. And because there's always something to worry about, there's always something to resolve, it's very easy to get caught up in that cycle. And I think when we can start to almost distance ourselves and recognize that anxiety and or fear is just a state of being and it's not something to tackle, it's something to go, I'm feeling a bit scared today. And what do I need? What does that child in me need in this moment? needs comfort needs some reassurance and it needs to let go of the detail because this isn't about the detail or whatever it is I could or couldn't be worrying about. For me, anxiety was pretty torturous because I wasn't worrying about anything. It was in my body. I physically felt scared all the time. And so I couldn't look to anything external to resolve it because I felt it just so physically in my chest every day. And I realized I just felt afraid, just intuitively felt scared. And that in order to kind of ease that, I needed to make myself feel as safe as possible. And so part of my resolution wasn't about not challenging myself to speak up or take on a big presentation or whatever it was that was triggering it. It was about going, actually, Can you make sure that the relationships in your life are as nurturing as possible? Can you make sure that you're not saying yes to things that intuitively feel wrong for you? Can I ground myself at home and create a sense of safety so that when I walk home and walk in the front door, I can just 
breathe out and know I am safe emotionally, spiritually, physically on every single level. And that made an absolutely massive difference. And now when I feel scared, um, or scared's the wrong word, fear, it's kind of merged with excitement. It's normally now an indicator that I'm going to up level in some way. That I'm going to take on some new project or my book, my book's coming out. I'm a bit fearful of that. It's a bit exposing, but it's exciting. And I know I'm challenging myself to step away from that comfort. And that's good because being comfortable isn't always safe. Actually, what's Mm. safe for me is about expressing my creativity, about being brave, about connecting to who I am as a woman. Having a relationship with my husband was literally one of the most frightening things I've ever done because it was so intimate. It challenged me to be so much more vulnerable than I ever had before. And thank God, thank God I turned into that fear. I didn't try and tackle it and manage it. I embraced it. I trusted that this must be something really good for it to be provoking such an intense reaction in me. And it was, it was amazing. Yeah, I really resonate with what you said about kind of the comfort zone. And what I I really found is that I try and control external things to feel safe, but actually... Mm -hmm you end up making your world so small that you don't even feel safe, you know, sitting Mm. at home, you know, and Mm. if you do have to challenge yourself, then that becomes, that kind of pushes you over the edge. And Mm. I love what you said about kind of creating that safety within ourselves that then allows us to, to get to the point where maybe things that are challenging become more exciting rather than, than, Mm. you know, something that's going to be really anxiety provoking. Yeah. I love that. I love that perspective. Mm. (laughs) Is there anything else that you want to share with the listeners? Any kind of final insights or wisdom that you really want to to share? I guess I think in my work always, um, whether it was working um, in a clinical setting as a psychotherapist or now as a coach or writing, I guess people, I want people to know that things can change and be different for them. I think so often we feel hopeless because we've maybe tried things or we've we've tried to create shifts and they haven't quite happened for us and we left feeling as if we just have to get on and accept our lot. And I guess what I want people to learn either from my own journey or through my work is that things can be different for them and that they can hope for more and that they just need to be a bit brave. That's all we need to just be a bit brave Um, And if we can be a bit brave, we start making slightly different decisions and our world start to reflect that. Um, People treat us differently when we command a kind of relationship of respect and kindness from ourselves. Then that's what we begin to communicate to the rest of the world too, about what we deserve, about what we need, what we expect. Um, And it's quite powerful. And it doesn't take huge things for those shifts to happen. So, yeah, I think that would probably be it. That's brilliant. Thank you. And thank you so much for everything that you shared. So, so powerful. And yeah, I really hope listeners can take this to heart and read your book and, you know, go out and um, make big changes for themselves. Where can people find out more about you and what you're up to? And obviously your book is going to be out by the time this podcast comes out. So mm-hmm. get that on all good bookshops, find yeah. your true voice. Um, but yeah, where can people find out more about you? Um, so you can come to my uh, website, which is emmybronner.com and you can find out about some of the free courses that I run. Um, and they're often sort of peppered throughout the year. I'm running different things. Um, my clinic is the recoverclinic.co.uk if you feel like you need a little bit more support there's also free advice there Um, anyone can call and speak to a clinician Um, and good old Instagram Um, I'm constantly on there trying to offer free guidance free advice and I do have like an ask Emmy feature on there where people can send in questions and I'll respond to them Um, so yeah lots of lots of places Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for everything you shared. 